Well, good, good evening. I should say I'm a very boring person. I've been a bureaucrat in, in city government, in national government, in the European Commission, so layers of boringness uh, have accumulated on me, and I make no apology for that. I think bureaucracy, some of the time, is boring and should be boring. I am now in an engineering department at a university, and in engineering, though, it is assumed the implementation has to be methodical and rigorous and careful and a bit boring. But it's the implementation of ideas which are often incredibly imaginative, like space rockets or bridges crossing seas or, or new AI to discover proteins. And I've become obsessed in the last few years, even though most of my work is quite boring stuff, that we have a problem with imagination in government. Uh, and uh, before the pandemic, I started talking to lots of activists and leaders and politicians and you may be an unusual group, but most of them found it very easy to picture collapse, ecological collapse in the near future. They could imagine the technological futures of AI and drones and robots. But if you ask them, what could our welfare system, our health system, our democracy, our neighborhoods look like in 20, 30 years? They really struggled. And just ask yourself, you know, what is the average age a child born in Berlin this year will reach? It's probably something like 100. So our timescales are completely out of sync with the reality of the world around us. Now that prompted me to use the lockdowns to write a book about the history of imagination. And I looked at the utopias, just mentioned by Christian. You know, feminist utopias from 600 years ago. The 19th century had an extraordinary explosion of utopian thinking about property and economy and rights and cities and so on. I look at the model towns, the social movements like veganism, and the ways in which these things have percolated and changed and, uh, and evolved. And I tried to set out some of the methods we can use to fuel imagination, from world building to speculative design to, uh, to, to experiments of all kinds, methods which are hardly used at all in government at the moment. And I got so carried away, the chapter on the arts, I turned into a, a whole other book on how art doesn't really describe our future, but helps us think and opens up our minds, our feelings, to understand you know, what's it like to be a tree, or what's it like to be inside an algorithm, or what's, uh, what's, what's the possibilities of a town thinking 100, 200, 300 years into the future. Only art can do that, and we need these new integrative sort of methods to help us escape from this, this, this dominance of dystopias when the last 50 years, there have essentially been almost no utopias in fiction, in film, in TV, to help us see a positive possibility ahead. So what might that mean for government? Here, uh, at the end of the day, let me just suge suggest very quickly six elements of what I think could be the imagination of future government and bureaucracy, all of which have been talked about today. One is democracy itself, hot democracy. How do we move to a democracy of collective intelligence? Whereas a matter of course, it's not just sending representatives to a Bundestag or a council, but actually the citizens are involved in observing, understanding problems, proposing solutions, commenting, adapting, and so on. We have a whole array of tools for doing this, but again, hardly used in our oldest democracies. And indeed, the US still has an almost 18th century model. How do we, second element of the future, Imagine a government which really is intelligent, lots of discussion of intelligence, but one which put intelligence at its core as the mirror for the hot democracy. So that whether it's a pandemic or climate change, within government you have people gathering the data, the evidence, the tacit knowledge, and so on, and synthesizing this into truly smart answers. Again, nowhere in the world actually does this yet. I look at the very boring topic of money. Our public finance is long overdue, uh, a, a transformation. We don't use, again, data and AI to understand finance, and our time horizons of money are crazy. If you're building a bridge or a road, you look at capital assessments over 30, 40, 50 years, but if you're spending money on people, in health, education, social security, it's treated as an annual expense, not as an investment with a long-term payback. Absolutely insane. We need to look at new ways of organizing experiment because we don't want utopias imposed on societies. We want the ideas to generate experiments. And so we need social R&D alongside traditional hardware science R&D. 
Canada, Australia, a few countries are beginning to do this in a small scale, but very small scale. And we need what I call mesh government. More and more government has to be not a hierarchy pyramid, but a mesh of different tiers and of collaborations with society, with civil society, with business. And this needs new organizing models. And then we need the future built into how government works itself. And here we're beginning to see some fascinating experiments around the world. How do you actually get future generations' interests taken into account in today's decisions? Uh, Wales passed a Future Generations Act a few years ago and has one person to be Future Generations Commissioner, which is not exactly enough to transform a whole bureaucracy. But the question of how we embed the needs of the future, the needs of the biosphere into today's decisions is one we all have to grapple with and will require, again, some experiment, some imagination, some creativity. Now, as I said, in engineering, it's taken for granted Efficiency and imagination are not alternatives. There is no point being efficient if you're using the engineering ideas of 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And the same has to apply to government. And that's why we need the structures, the teams, the cultures, which are constantly helping us to generate these roadmaps, these pictures of where we could be going 20, 30, 40 years into the future. And this is vital for democracy. At the moment, we are seeing declining confidence in democracy for lots and lots of reasons, but one is actually declining confidence in the capacity of the state to act. And our modern democracy is absolutely interwoven with the state and with bureaucracy. They're not alternatives. And so rewiring, reimagining, reinvigorating the state is crucial to rebuilding confidence in democracy. And there are alternatives, there are competitors. I was last week in East Asia. The Chinese model of a very powerful AI-driven, data-driven surveillance state is one which is being promoted as an alternative to all the things we're talking about here today. And it will claim it's better place to solve the problems of climate change and ill health and poverty and so on than the d democratic alternatives, which we used to call the West, but actually are now as strong in countries like Taiwan uh, or, or, or India or Bangladesh as they are in the old heartlands of Europe and North America. So my final encouragement to you, apart from read the book and disagree with it and, and use it, uh, is to try and act on some of these ideas. Think how they can be institutionalized. Because this is the essence of the bureaucratic insight, is if you really want things to change, you embed them in jobs, in institutions, in programs. We're beginning to see this around imagination, everything from museums of the future to social science parks, to big philanthropic foundations in the UK have been running whole programs on collective imagination, to city mayors running open processes of thinking 20, 40, 60 years into the future. We need these things to become part of our <coughs> collective everyday life. And my very final suggestion to you comes is a quote which is put on the, the wall of the Scottish Parliament, an amazing building designed by a Catalan architect, uh, as Scotland sort of got semi-independence 20 years ago. And it's the words of a Canadian poet who said, the best way to live is not as if you're at the peak, but to imagine yourself in the early years of a better civilization. And for me, that's the essence of the Creative Bureaucracy Festival, is how all of us who are in and around and part of governments, how we live, think, and act as if we were in the early years of a better civilization. Thank you.